The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Uh, introductions, Audrey Schulman, hey. Heat, Home Energy Efficiency Team. I'm Nathan Phillips. I teach at Boston University. And uh, the previous speakers, I think, really talked to how the environmental problems that we have are either invisible or very hard to grasp. So being able to see these things with evidence, photographs, or having simple and precise metrics to understand the magnitude of our, our uh, climate impacts is important. So this is very much in line with this. And so if um, some of you here have been with us from the start when we met here a couple weeks ago, um, some of you came in midstream. So we laid out this problem about the methane gas leaks from the natural gas pipeline infrastructure under Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, Eastern United States. Um, then we talked about uh, solutions. We had a hackathon uh, about a week and a half ago or a week ago. And then yesterday, Audrey and I and some of the people in this room hopped in a van and we started sniffing these gas leaks and mapping them on Google Earth. And so we just wanted to share with you uh, how many people were actually in the van with us. So, so a, good, yeah, a good chunk of us here. So this was us yesterday. And this is a combined map here um, of both of the trips that we took. So the first van load, we have had a full van of 12 people. And we drove from here to Somerville and back. And then we pretty much did the same thing with a little slight variation in the second trip. So let's see. Here, here, so that's where we are right now. Is that correct, Audrey? Yeah. yeah okay. so, and, the, and the important thing to know is that there's a baseline about two parts per million uh, in this so that the wall everywhere is just the baseline of methane that exists. That it, if, you know, that, uh, it used to be lower. <laughs> Let's oh, just, not, no, okay. let's share this, please. Uh, <laughs> but actually, actually please, Brent. Street, right? Sorry? That spike, so it's Vassar Street, that's the methane. Yeah, so here, um, uh, so there's a big leak somewhere here, uh -huh. uh, right in front of the most iconic part of MIT. Oh, sorry, you want me to? Oh, I'll do it. OK. Yeah, um, but the, uh, the wall here that you see of everywhere where we drove, that's sort of just the parts per million of, of methane that's just background noise. Uh, um, and uh, the big spikes are where there were leaks. Um, so uh, you can, and what's interesting to, is we did a, a s survey of Cambridge and Somerville two years ago, and there was a leak here. Um, so there still is. It's nice to know. Um, what, uh, what do you want to say? Um, well, let's, how about we go to uh, the area, what was that, Prince Street in Somerville? Uh, Pearl Street. Pearl, yeah. Pearl Street. Let's so, take a look. OK. So and, you can just sort of, uh, so here's us uh, going by Kendall. I'll just sort of, uh, going by yeah. Kendall. <laughs> It'll pick up on it. I'm OK. Um, and then, uh, then back, whoopsie. Ah. I'm having a problem Thanks for driving, driving uh, Audrey. <laughs> I, I, I'm not good at Mac, so I'm OK. OK, yeah, no, Mac is, Mac is my language. Um, so uh, that's Pearl Street there, okay. uh, the big, the big uh, uh, mountains. Now, um, these are all national grid, right? Yeah, so the, tra the difference between Eversource and national grid is this train track right here. Okay. So this is Eversource down here. This is national grid up there. And uh, we don't know what's going on, whether there's a difference in uh, its operating pressure of the pipes, or age of the pipes, uh, material of the pipes, or difference in how the two companies deal with leaks. But uh, it, you know, two years ago when we did the survey, there were this, you know, this area of national grids was uh, the Swiss Alps of, Switzer of Somerville. And it seems to still be that way. 
So just a couple observations, and, and, and please, you were there, so offer your own observations, your questions uh, about this, because this is a very rich data set. It raises lots of questions to me. So you can see here, there's actually a couple traces, right? Like here, there's two traces. We drove it two times in two trips. You see that there's some variation each time, and we talked about the vagaries of wind, and you know if the wind's blowing harder in one direction one time, you'll get something slightly different. Um, so, so is this a leak? Is it the same thing as this? What do we actually, uh, how do we take continuous data like this and, and, and objectify it in terms of, well, there is a leak? It's, it's difficult, it's, it's tricky to do. Um, and you know there are pipeline leaks, there are holes in pipes, and then there are methane leaks, and they come out of the ground. So th even the terminology we use is, is, is not quite um, you know, fully worked out. There's, there's a lot here. Um, uh, some of the things that, so, so in terms of um, at one level, at a very broad level, Pearl Street is a mess. It's leaking methane all along that street. Um, when we get to policy, State policy want, makers and the utilities and the regulators want, want to know, well, how many leaks are there? Because that determines like, you know, how many crews they're going to go out and how they're going to schedule and how they're going to get reimbursed or uh, repaid for, for a fixed number of things that they do. So this is a, this is a complicated kind of um, policy science type of, um, of, of, of framework. Do you have uh, any other Yeah, I want to point out one thing in terms of uh, policy. Um, this area right here is uh, where they did, uh, they uh, taken out the ga cast iron main that is quite old and put in plastic. And we could see, uh, I think that that's, I'm, I'm, is that yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that is. We can go in closer. But uh, there was one part where we saw that they'd taken out the old gas main and put in a new, uh, better one. And uh, I'm betting it's that area. So the utilities were surprised by this? Uh, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so when we published our, our first um, publication in late 2012, early 2013, it, it, it basically made a problem that was well known to the utilities, known to at least, I, I won't say everyone, but people who saw the paper and, and, and members of the public that read the, you know, some of the press that came out about it. <clears throat> so that was uh, unexpected to the utilities and it kind of knocked them back. It's like, oh, what, we have data that's coming out. That, so they, they didn't control the data. Um, and, and so just by virtue of having data out there, it, it has, basically um, kind of say balance the power a little bit um, or a lot um, to, to get um, you know change to happen and policy to be made. Is this oh. Franklin? Yeah, I don't know. I couldn't oh. see. I like <laughs> I uh, tried to figure it out, but anybody know Somerville really well? What's the street parallel to Rowland? Oh yeah. Um, Nathan, in the meantime, can yeah. you assign uh, these spikes to a specific pipe? Or uh, how, what's the special resolution of assigning yeah. a spike to a... Yeah, so, so when we um, go by here, you know, like this, any one of these kind of discrete spikes, uh, the window in which leaks may be coming out is, is, is probably on the order of a few tens of meters, okay? Um, and, and that's dictated both by the spatial uh, source, it may, even one pipeline leak, like I said, could be coming up in various locations, and then the wind may be blowing it around. So that's what this is allowing us to do, but then, but then streets sometimes have multiple pipelines running down the same street. Sometimes they only have one uh, main running down the street. Um, so you have to go in uh, a little more carefully and use um, basically probes that check what's coming out of the ground to actually pinpoint the actual pipe and where it's leaking. So this doesn't do this. This basically just says, 
Pearl Street's a mess and it's got a lot of leak problems. And it requires a, a walking survey to go back and to, to um, you know, be more. Have you done some very basic signal processing on it? So run a low pass or a filter just to see, just to get rid of the small frequencies? No. And I think that's the type of analysis that okay. would be fabulous to do here. Know anybody who can help? I, I can take it further. Sorry? If you, like your colleagues, uh, uh, Kaufman and Kula Pilata started first field, yeah. looking at um, electricity signals and see whether there's a pattern on inefficiency, same signal processing. So you could, if you could look, you can detect the pattern that reflects the leak. And yeah. Then, say, then you have a product that you drive around and pinpoint leaks on gas pipes. I know that it's a huge work. So, so here's one thing that um, I think we, Audrey and I have both been trying to make progress on is how do you take this data and, and use it to help us start to quantify how much is coming out? And that's also a very difficult thing because first of all, you're looking at this and it implies something quantitative, but you don't see any numbers here, right? So probably you're wondering, well, how, how big are these spikes? And, and, and actually, you know, this data just came out, so um, I haven't been able to process. Um, but we know that this is sitting right around um, 2.0, maybe 1.95. I, I forget what our baseline is. It's in the KML file. We could open that up. It's just a text file. It tells you what we set the baseline at. Um, that baseline can shift from day to day, by the way. Um, you know, what is this value? I'll have to find it out. It, it would be great to, we were talking about something that um, some students could do is come up with a processor that just basically plops numbers on here so we could see that. What was the concentration? Um, if we go, you know, just, just for setting a scale, I remember, and we, the four of us in the van for the second um, round, we went to uh, Sullivan Square. And I think, what was the top read we got there? We were reading it off it was, in the It was like 60. 90, wasn't it? Wasn't uh, it something really ridiculous? I've never yeah. seen that number before. Yeah, I think, it, I recall up around 67 or 70 parts per million <laughs> in the air. So, so that sets so it's, the scale. So it's that speak, uh, spike yeah, right there, scale. see? So, you know, there's something really interesting about this. So, so we can put numbers on that. We, we have done that, and, and it's just I haven't, we haven't had a chance to, to do it. Um, but, you know, actually, uh, this is really a, a very interesting issue of, of data display. I, I'd be interested, who's that data person that the display of data? He has those, yeah. I'd be interested to hear someone like that's take because there was a utility person from National Grid that, that basically called us out on this, okay? And, and the point this person made was it's like, you're scaring people by doing this. You're, you're taking... It's an apples and oranges thing. You're putting some data, and, and, and all of the houses and all of us are like down here, mm -hmm. and you're creating these things that are just like making it look like the world is ending, right? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I kind of get that at one level, um, is that you know th this is a really apples to oranges type of thing, because we're, we're conflating PPM values, parts per million, with meters or space, you know, and they're, they're, they're like two different beasts and we're like putting them together. But I will say this, as a scientist, the first thing I was trained as a freshman was if you have data and you're going to graph it, use the space available to fit your data, you know, and maximize that space. So when I, I want to plot this, I want to make it, you know, visible as best I can. But like Ori, I think it might be useful to come up with a unit that it's understandable right. as a measurement unit. Right? Yes. I, it could be anything. You know, like background. I, I will not mention that word, but stuff that comes out of us as the, <laughs> as the, you know, what is the concentration, right? So something that says. Yeah, like what, what, what we, uh, what Nathan's idea is, is to sort of take. Uh, like just sort of some number that covers this whole area for this leak so that it adds up the whole area underneath right. that. So you can bin that, but I'm just, I mean, that's just, but I'm saying as an understandable measure, mm -hmm. something that says the height is this okay. is yeah. measured in terms of unit that we all recognize as a relevant unit for guess. But you could, you could also, without any topography. Sure. Yes, yes, exactly. But you, you could. 
important to reverse model it, right? So put it in an atmospheric model and say the concentration at, you know, three feet above the ground is X, what's the leak rate have to be to yes. get that concentration here, you know, in this pattern, right. and figure out what how much they're actually emitting, and then you have a number that is, at least in terms of their dollars, right? Right. But it's, it's hard to do that somewhat because the yeah. wind will be going right, but by. The, the, right, but the wind, so you do it on a couple days and you have, you put in the wind data to your model mm -hmm. and then your model says this this methane disperses at this rate, it back calculates a, I mean from your concentration back calculates an emission based on the weather data as well. Normalize that over multiple days of testing yep. and then you say, okay, this roughly equates to X emission. And, and there are research groups that are are trying to do exactly that. So what you have are the turbulence experts, the people that study m micrometeorology and boundary layers. And I'm not that person. I know that person. I don't. Uh, I'm not person. to speak for you. <laughs> um, but these these are the the future areas um, to, to to take this and to try to model. See, I, I'm wondering again whether is this a physics problem or a statistics problem. And, yes. and I think they may be, yes, yes. <laughs> right. meaning, meaning that some of, because I feel like some of these things, you can get very complex physics yeah. because of the nature of the scales at which you're trying to model this thing, or you know, run a machine learning algorithm against it and see what is your best predictor. And I just want to make a, couple, a really quick point here is there's, like, here's one of these spikes, right? This value, let's say it's 10 ppm, that's, that's important on its own right. because, for example, air quality is related to concentration of methane in the air. It's a precursor to ozone, okay? Um, the area under this curve, we think, may be a correlate for how much is coming out, right. and that is becomes an energy point or an equivalent carbon unit yes. is, is this area under the curve. Um, but, you know, these need to be validated and, and just, Everyone in the class now, I think, I sent the email out, you have the, the KML file, um, that you have this data, you have, a, you have an ASCII data file which generated this. Um, you, you'd have to, you know, the columns are actually pretty easy to understand for the most part. But you are now empowered, this is community <laughs> science, you can explore and analyze um, and run with this data. I could forward it to everybody who signed in. Nathan, I have an unrelated question that I'm really curious about. Have you ever driven near a cow farm, a, a yeah. beef farm? Oh yeah. What's the so so uh, the, the one that sticks right? out in my mind is driving from San Francisco to LA on Interstate Five, getting close to the Southern Mountains, giant feedlot right next to um, I five. And you know, very flat baseline, and then you know this very sloping increase as we passed by that feedlot to about, I think it was um, two and a half, three parts per million of methane going going from below two. But but the thing there, it's not it's not like this spike like we're seeing here. It's just this mm -hmm. yeah, block. Very very but that's why I think integration is important, right? So you yeah. want to do not just uh, a spike, but right. a spike times area or more. Which, which, a, which an air dispersion model would essentially would do. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's a question. Somebody help us with this. Yeah, yeah, these are great ideas. Question. I just wanted to know um, can you get a hold of this device or um, how much does it cost? Or? The Picaro analyzer that we used, the, uh, you know, the, and that's now six, seven years old, that was about $60,000. And the uh, the manufacturer, you know, it's kind of like, you know, they don't have a price list. They're like, call us and let's talk, you know. So that's just for so, the box with the mirrors and the laser? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's so not this really. This is the kind of stuff we have to invent. Yeah. But I, what I will say is that, or maybe. Audrey wants to talk about the handheld, the Sierra Club. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, so there might, there might be, so he might at some point have a, through Sierra Club, Massachusetts, have a handheld device with which you can check uh, for that, that uh, something like that combustible gas indicator for anybody who's on the, the drive yesterday. So it would be, uh, you'd be able to check the gas in the soil to find out if the tree is being poisoned by gas, uh, et cetera. Yep. Oh, yes, and, and I can't fail, someone, who was it, came up with the idea of a bike um, 
the bike trailer with you the, did. the, the your idea. Huh? <laughs> Sorry about that. that was your idea. Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> now you're making me. Uh, well, so that would be amazing, and there is a reason for it, it's because as we mentioned, you know these mains, they can run. You know they. More times than not, they run kind of down the middle of the street, but they can go on sidewalks, they can go at angles. Um, the service lines leak, and, and so much of what we've done has not been looking at the service lines, the perpendicular smaller pipes that go into the houses. So with a bike or a cart or, or an ability to get on sidewalks, or, and to be able to move around in Boston or Cambridge, you know if you ride a bike, that's the most efficient way to get around. I mean, if there's a gridlock, you're just, going around. Baby so, carriages. Or baby carriages. <laughs> Be able, and, and, and so Picaro does sell a, um, a smaller unit than that one. Uh, it's like a backpack unit, but it could go in a burly trailer. Well, it could go on your back while you're, while you're riding a bike. Um, so I would love that. It would be the first one in the nation, and I think it would be amazing. So if we can crowdsource that, generate some funds, that would be great. Well, could the existing Picaro that you had in the van, can that uh, be mounted by uh, that and the battery and power. Could that be mounted on a, a trailer behind a bike for example? Yeah, it could. It could. We we could actually, you know, what you we could make a video with that, and and that would be like, let's do it better. And you know, and because I think what you'd use there is a like a garden cart with those big balloon knobby tires to provide some, um, you know, uh, shock uh, absorption. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And actually, let me make a point of sort of order, which is that now that we, I, I, I think the formal portion of your presentation is done, right? right. So, okay, so I think that we can now ask questions of all the speakers, not just. Okay. After uh, giving all three. Yes. But we have Susan's yes, last question. I, I just was wondering because on the field trip, um, I learned, you know, what the symbolism is by the gas company and what kind of like cast iron that was written on the sidewalk there. If the company has the infrastructure in its, uh, you know, archives or, or, is there enough of a relationship between the age of the pipe and the material to know the leak so you could make big assumptions about, okay, yes. if you know that, then you don't even have to do the monitoring. The Department of Environmental Protection is making that exact point in terms of basing all of the statewide greenhouse gas methane uh, emissions based on exactly that calculation of miles of cast iron, miles of bare steel, et cetera, and making an assumption that, that's, that, that they know the exact rate of emissions per mile of uh, cast iron main, and that they don't even have to check. Um, no, you know, either top down or bottom up either. Uh, and I think that that's, uh, you can make a, a, a somewhat uh, a guess at that, but you have to check um, to, you know, make sure it's right. Yeah, they just, they call my emissions factors and activity factors, and it, you multiply A by B and you get a leak rate. And these, you know, I call them fudge factors. They basically say cast iron has this many leaks per linear mile. That's your emissions factor. Well, how many miles do you have? That's your activity factor. Multiply A by B, there's your leak rate. But those are based on very kind of old, not just old data, but very sparse data. Um, but can you calibrate that with your leak data? Yeah, that's what we're, I mean, that's what we're, we're doing. It doesn't, um, I don't think it has much to do with each other. I mean, like, uh, the, the Department of Environmental Protection emissions factors make it look like the problem solved. Um, and I don't think that that's true. Well, they're, I mean, they're probably API emissions factors, right? So they're from the industry and they're way outdated. Like this, yeah. this is true, they're outdated for refineries. So when they go out and do modern testing on refineries, they see that tanks yeah. leak at much higher rates than their emissions factors so account for. There's a really interesting point. The state, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts apparently has done an enormous job at cleaning up our methane leak problem because what they did was the DEP utilized an early set of emissions factors for natural gas leakage um, from the mid 90s and then one from that was much lower uh, from 2015 publication, okay, 
and they linear and they linearly interpolated an emissions factor so that you would they hardwired in a reduction because two studies showed two different emissions factors for the same kind of pipe, and so the result you get it, it appears to make it look like we've done really really well. It's incredible. <laughs> Everything's solved. Um, and part of the way they did that was they got rid of uh, super emitters, a big a high or one of the studies. Uh, discarded any outliers. Right, so so the emissions factors are based on leaks are distributed like this. But what we know is that leaks are distributed like that. They're, they're long tail with few. I, I mean, I would say that the normal versus long tail is a, an error across so many yes. domains. Yes. Yes. That, yes. 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 And you know we can all take a look at this data and make a guess as to where the long tail problem is. You know it's it's fairly apparent. So it's fifty percent from seven. Percent of That's what we Margaret Hendrick uh, did a study uh, that we did um, together that seven seven of a hundred leaks accounted for fifty percent of the, the gas loss. If you take that this data is kind of a sample and multiply by the number of roads and pipelines. If you try to match it with the entire uh, methane in my in inventory of the U.S., just to see that the numbers are the same old as the Yeah, we did, uh, not with the entire U.S., but we did it with Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and it matches? Like, um, yeah, so so it, it, it we found that, that if we took the chamber measurements of leaks, uh, 100 leaks, and we just kind of multiplied that out by the frequency of leaks that we got previously, um, that 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 amount is consistent with um, other estimates, um, um, and, and and are about one third of the total uh, methane emissions estimated for um, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. One third. One third. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. This collaboration that we have, um, to me, and, and with Mothers Out Front, as a kind of hybrid advocacy uh, science. Nonprofit um, kind of coalition. I've never been involved in anything like that, and it's just been the most fulfilling kind of partnership for research, science, and yeah. policy.